jump in. So uh, Cora's out today, so I'm kind of running the show. Uh, so we're going to kick it off with Dorian going through um, the auth pattern, which is the set of pages that Drew built for uh, making you know all the different pages required. So forgot password, sign in, sign up, all those things. It's making it a little easier to start. And then he's going to take us through all the auth settings and things like email provider settings for sending those forgot password and signing up with token emails, that kind of thing. Um, and then I'll jump in and talk about data and page authentication. And then Drew's going to go into Google and Twitter auth. Um, so let's dive in. Um, Dorian, you want to show your screen and we yep. can get started. Let's see which one minutes. Cool. So, okay. Can you guys see that? Yeah, perfect. And what's the size on that? Okay. Looks okay to us, to me. Yeah. All righty. So here, I literally just created a new project, and I just imported uh, Drew's auth pattern. So I'll just go over quickly just how to do that. So when you're in the studio, at the top, you're going to see the patterns button. When you click that, it gives you a drop down here. And you're going to see Drew's pattern here under user authentication. Just click import. You can name the workspace something else if you choose to. I just left it as is, hit next. Uh, for the data, uh, it doesn't actually matter for this one if you include it or not. It actually doesn't have any because it just uses the builder's default user, user's data. So you can just ignore that step if you want. It doesn't matter. Hit import. I already did it, so I'm not going to do it again. And what that does is it brings all these pages to that workspace that got created. And the first thing uh, you'll see on here is uh, Drew created this really cool page here for a readme, which he included a video that kind of steps you through the setup and anything you need to do to get any of the buttons tied or do any of those settings. Uh, which for this one, for the most part, there really isn't much to do because it does default to using the builder's built-in user data collection. So like, for example, if I were to go into the sign up button and dive into that action and go here to the actual request that's creating the new user, you'll notice that it already automatically selected your user's table. Um, so unless you're trying to store that outside of the user's data collection, you don't really need to change much. Um, but if you are trying to use like an external source to store your users and auth, then you'd basically just swap this action out to whatever API call you're doing for that. But in our case, since we're using the internal, nothing to do, everything's already set up just by simply bringing in that pattern. Um, in Drew's pattern, he has two forms here, one where you can sign up with the password, which is this one here. And then he also has one where it basically does that same request just without a password. So if you do go through this method, then basically you're, it's assuming that the user is going to use a magic link or a sign-in token, another name for that to authenticate into the, the web app. Um, so let me go back to the README page here. So there's a couple of settings here um, that Drew kind of lays out on examples on how to fill in this information. We'll take a look once we dive into the auth settings in a second. But in the template here that he created or pattern, uh, he's basically giving you the steps on how to connect it if you're going to use SendGrid. Uh, but keep in mind that Builder it's basically just an open API request. So you don't have to use SendGrid. You can use any email provider um, that's out there. Uh, but in this example, it's just giving you the specifics for SendGrid. So this is the post URL, the headers, an example of it, uh, an example of the body. That's how SendGrid wants it formatted. Uh, but if you are using a different email provider, then of course, all of these settings will change based on that email provider. So you can just reference uh, to their API documentation to get those details. But let me dive into the auth setting. So on the left side, on the menu here, you're going to see authentication settings. And when a new project is created, 
Uh, if you notice here by default, authentication is on by default, but you can toggle that off if it's maybe you're just building a straight up website where there is no authentication required. So by toggling that off, it automatically just hides all the settings because there's nothing for you to do in there. Um, but in our scenario here, we want it on. The default signup method does default to public signup. Basically, this means that you can create end users both internally through the user's data collection on the left side menu here, or your users can sign up using a signup method, which is included in Drew's pattern. So I'll go ahead and leave it to that option there. So those are the two there. Uh, the next step on here is the end user signup settings. Um, so what this means is when a user does sign up using a signup method, um, how are they going to be like? How is the user going to be created when the user is created? Like for example, do you want them to immediately have access to the project, which is what the default is here? Uh, most of the time, if you are building a new web app and kind of just created the landing page uh, and you don't really have a place, a destination yet for the end users to go to like their dashboard or something like that, then that's when you'll typically use a waiting list. Uh, when you do toggle it to a waiting list, you get several more options. So the first one here is an email provider settings. Basically, this will trigger an email to get sent automatically to that user when they're created. Um, just kind of like letting them know, like, thanks for signing up and whatever you provide in that email template. And then you can also provide uh, expiration token settings on that. Um, when you do decide to move that user off the wait list, then that will trigger the second email that you provide here in the email provider settings. Um, and by default, it just sets the token to expire within 15 minutes but you can come in here and change it and you have different options here. And Dorian, on the email provider settings, so like with SendGrid, on, if, if any of you all have used SendGrid, there's basically like a template ID in SendGrid. And so what you're gonna do is go into SendGrid and you'll make a template for when they're added to the wait list, you make another template for when they're off the wait list. And then when you go into the email provider settings, you can, you can if you're using SendGrid, just straight up copy what Drew put in there and just swap out all the variable values like the template ID and things. Um, so Dorian, if you open that first yeah, email. Yeah, I was setting. about to dive in there. Perfect. So let's take a look at that, just like Mark was saying here. So when you do open that link, it opens to this larger window where you can provide the post URL. In this example, it would go here if we're using SendGrid. For the headers, this is for the authentication. And this part here, you would actually provide your key instead of the text that I have static there. And then for the body, let me just grab Drew's example here. So the template ID, so this is what Mark was referring to. So in SendGrid, when you create those email templates, each email gets a unique ID, which then uh, it's basically how this API call knows and tells SendGrid which email to trigger to send to that end user that signed up. Um, one of the things that you also need to provide is the, the group ID. And this is, uh, you have to create unsubscribe groups. I believe it's a requirement. Um, and SendGrid provides you that ID. So that's where you'll plug that in. And then the rest of this is pretty straightforward. It's just the from email address that you want the receiver to see that it came from, the name. And then under, this is in the SendGrid template method, but there are some internal dot notation field references that you, that builder can interpret and automatically fill in dynamically. And Drew actually lists all of these back on the README page. Uh, but basically, it just starts with, uh, with the brackets here. And or I guess it's carrots, or I forget what these are called. <laughs> but it's basically builder.data.dot 
and then it follows a naming convention here. So for to get the email address of that user, it's just secret. Uh, it's all camel face login ID. If you want to provide them with the token, which is the magic link to sign in, it's just again builder.data.token login ID. And then you can even grab the URL protocol, the URL subdomain, and the URL domain. Um, this is useful for when you do have a project published and you have a custom domain set up and you want to dynamically feed uh, that template data to the to SendGrid in this example, but you could do it with any provider. Uh, it'll just dynamically grab those values from the page that the user was in when they requested the sign in, sign up, or the magic link. So very cool things that you can do and you don't have to statically provide that here. So any questions on the reference fields? Uh, Dorian, is it the same? It's the same syntax for page headers and for uh, the data references for page headers, right? It, the same it follows a similar format. The only difference is when you're referencing the internal fields, um, mm -hmm. you're actually providing the the group ID and the field ID. Gotcha. Yeah, so, and it's it's not so, builder dot. Also, it's it's kind of different. Yeah, it I think different. it just starts okay. with data, right? Yeah, just data, and then like yeah, the filter set ID, and then the field ID. Gotcha. That's not why I wanted to call that out to make sure that because there's other places where we reference that, and they may not be exactly compatible here. And this is specific to user data, right? So exactly, there's there's only certain information that it'll push through. Yeah, yeah. Basically, all these that we have listed here are the only things you can get out of that for the user, at least for now. Hey, Dorian, uh, do we also, can we also code in the, the secret for the API or do we have to put the specific API directly in? In here, you do have to put it in specifically. Uh, we are working on upgrading this whole site so you can actually pull the dynamic data from any collection. So once we get that, we'll provide you guys with the syntax. I would imagine it'd be something like builder.secret. You know, the ID, um, but yeah. It's definitely something that we want to do. But John, that is protected. That's never exposed to the client, right? So it's, it's exposed only in the studio. And so it does still treat it as a secret. You know, it's just not going to be exposed anywhere. Yeah. Right. OK, so any questions on the email provider settings? Pretty straightforward. And again, just, you know, this is just showing the SendGrid example but you can tie to any email providers, you know, you're just providing the URL, any headers and the body. So all this is dynamically based on their documentation. Okay, so that's the end user signup settings. Uh, so that's waitlist. I guess the last one is verification email. What this does is when a user signs up, it creates the user and then they can't log in immediately. It basically, puts that user in verification required status. Uh, and they'll automatically send them an email based on the provider settings that you provide under this one here. Uh, once they do click on that link, that then changes the status to live. And then that user can now successfully sign in. And those are the three different end user signup types. So uh, Dorian, one other thing on that verification email, so when they, what, what you're gonna do in your, uh, they're gonna click a button typically in your email template that you've created in your other, in the other third party email provider service like SendGrid. So you create this template, it's got a button and you're gonna string together a URL that's specific to your project for on the button click. So it'll be, you know, myproject.builder.com or whatever the custom domain is, and then slash that token typically. Right, and then on that page that's going to open there, it's one of your project pages. That page is a verification page that's going to use that token to do the verify. Um, so there's another action that needs to run on that page that will then send that token request off and go, it's verified or it's not. And then along with that, the token expiration time is going to determine whether or not it's actually available to do anymore. Right, so if you set it to like a one day token expiration, then they have one day to click the link in that email. And so you'll need to handle the different scenarios where 
if the token is expired, you're going to get one response. So you give them a message saying, okay, well, you know, you'll need to you'll need to sign in again, or you can just send them another verification email again from there automatically and tell them, check your email, your token was expired, check your email, we just sent you another one. Um, so there are some additional steps you'll want to handle on those pages. Um, and I don't remember uh, if those are in. Yeah, I was going to say that's in all in the pattern. pattern. Yeah. yeah, so you don't actually have to set it up. There's like a verify page that you just have to send them to. And then it'll do all that stuff, handle all the error cases. It's one of those two on the right. Yeah, that top one, I think. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, so maybe just show those flows real quick in, in the page load. Yeah, so yeah. this is the verify page. So once the user signs up and they are using the verification email method, um, in your email provider email, you basically want to redirect the user to whatever route you have set up for this page here, if you're using this template. And basically on that page, on the page load, uh, what Drew has set up here already, he has the verify with token action. And if we dive into that one, uh, this is what Mark was saying, because in that email template, you direct them back to whatever route you set up on this page, but you do want to include the actual token followed. Um, and it doesn't matter how you provide it in the URL, you can do it as a query parameter, a segment. Um, the only thing is whatever method you take, you just need to make sure to match the action that's going to grab that value to get it from the right type, which in this case, um, it's set up to just take it from a query string um, where the value is in token. So in the SendGrid URL, it would be like, for example, builder.com uh, question mark token equals and then the value. So that's where this is assuming that token is in and it's where it's going to grab it. I think there's an example of that in the readme page too, that that link, if I remember correctly, at the bottom. Yeah, see a protocol yeah, exactly. said, yeah. Yep. Exactly. So if, if you look at the URL, um, so the little squiggly brackets here, this is how SendGrid uh, basically uses a, a dynamic data field reference because up here, we're sending the protocol, the subdomain and the domain when you create that URL in SendGrid, instead of just statically typing it in, you can just dynamically reference it from the values that you're pushing in the dynamic template data. So you can notice protocols basically pulling the value that we sent here. Subdomain, same thing, domain, slash, and then verify session. This would actually, this part here would actually have to be the URL route that you would set up for this page here. That way, when the user does go to that domain, it loads this page route, which loads this page. On page load of this uh, form here, then runs the verify token, which grabs the token from the query string in the token value, or the token, or sorry, the query string name token. And then based on that, if it's successful, Drew then runs the success action. If there is an error, he runs an error action. If the token was invalid, meaning it's expired, he runs a different action. Uh, if the user is trying to sign up and they're already on the wait list, he also shows a different action. And if we go dive into each of those, so let's look at the success first. So what he does is he just changes the label here from verifying your account to redirecting. And then he takes them to, in this case, he's just taking them back to the home which in your scenario, if they're authenticating, then this is where you can send them to whatever authenticated page uh, you're trying to get them to. For the error, he's just showing just the message that something went wrong. If it's invalid, uh, he's also showing an invalid. Um, one thing you can do here is if it was invalid, then that means the token typically expired. You can actually just, um, if you go to the actions and go to the users, you can just resend them a new token, which is this one, send magic link. And your message can just be like, you know, this token is already expired. We automatically sent you a new one, check your email. So all this fully dynamic for you to handle it however you choose to, um, but all the actions are there and pretty straightforward to get those set up. 
let me go back. Nice, thanks, Dorian. Authentication here. And there are some additional settings like the session settings. Um, this is like once a user is authenticated, uh, like how long do you want to allow their active session to remain valid? Basically, it'll auto sign them out at a certain amount of time. The default is 30 days, but you can change that to whatever interval you want, or you can even set it infinite if you never want them to be uh, signed out of their sessions. There are also password settings. Um, so when they are signing up and creating that password for the first time, like what is the minimum password length that you want to allow? The minimum integer characters, you know, like if you actually want integers in there. Uh, if you require a minimum special number of characters, if there's uppercase minimum number of characters, and then you, if, uh, you can also prevent them from using repeated characters. And then you can also then set how often their password gets expired if they need to renew it at, you know, after a certain number of times. So, so a lot of settings. Uh, these are the defaults when you first create a project. Um, so when you are setting up those authentication pages and on the sign up with password page, you know, you just basically want to make sure you handle all of these settings. That way your user, you know, if they don't type a password long enough, then you want to show them a message or, you know, do something that interact with the user so that they know that these are the requirements. And Dorian, um, just to clarify too, those settings uh, affect the server side restrictions. So this is in addition to any, <clears throat> you know, conditional logic you put on the form for validation. So um, if you don't put any validation on the form where they're entering this, on the input for that password, it's going to send whatever they, whatever they type in. And then you'll get a response back saying it's an invalid password. It won't create the user. And then you'll need to handle that with the proper messaging to your user. Exactly. Yeah. And And then the next one, uh, password reset options. Um, this is just, you know, if their password expires or they manually click the reset password link on your setup, um, this just gives you more control. Like, do you want to allow previously used passwords? Um, you can select a specific resort or reset password page. So when they do execute that reset password controller. Notice there is an email provider setting that you can provide. So you can automatically send an email that they get with the URL. Um, and in that URL, you can handle the page that it goes to so that they can enter the new password and then get re-authenticated. So restrict failed sign-in attempts. Uh, this gives you, like if a user is trying to sign in repeatedly and they keep failing, entering that wrong password. Uh, these are different settings that you can handle. By default, this is turned off. So it does allow them to just try infinite, but you can come in here, toggle it on, give it a number of tries. Um, you can then, you have two options once they do exceed the number of attempts. You can give them a cool off period and you specify the time. Um, and if you do want to send an email, you can toggle this on, fill in your email provider settings, uh, letting them know it's like, hey, you know, you're on a cool off period. This is how much you have to wait before we can allow you to attempt again. Um, or you can just automatically force a password reset. Um, so if you do have it on this, again, you just fill in your email providers and it will actually, no, for this one, um, it automatically the, does the reset password automatically, which right. comes from, from this one. And I think that that email provider says that last one, that's sort of like the notification to make sure that you know that someone had a failed attempt on your password, like somebody's trying to hack you sort of is the, is that, that's typically that email saying, did you know that there was a failed attempt on your attempt on your uh, login? Uh, so it should be used, at least the messaging, whatever the messaging is of that email needs to basically say, hey, there was a failed attempt on your email, I'm just making sure that was you, you know, that kind of messaging. Oh, 
Uh, Two-factor, if you do want to enable that, we have different uh, settings here. We got email, which again, you get the settings for that or SMS. Um, for the SMS, uh, I know further down the road, we're going to allow you to have email provider settings so you can use any third party service. Um, so that'll be coming soon. Uh, but for now, you can just control that by just using the email method anyways, because effectively it's really the same thing <laughs> internally at least. And then the last one is just the session validation setting. So this is the sign in token or I think we now call it the magic link. Uh, so this is just set, uh, basically allowing you to set up the email provider settings for the email that gets sent anytime a user uh, receives a magic link. And then you can control if you want an expiration time on that token. Uh, one thing to note on the magic link, um, that one, if it does, if the action that is uh, reading that magic link, if it does, um, if it is expired, it does automatically send another token, um, but you can handle in your configuration the message to the user letting it know. So cool. So those are all the off settings. Um, I don't know if there's any questions, anything you guys want to look at specifically or? Yeah, thank you, Dorian. Uh, I know that's a lot. There's a yeah. lot of settings in there. Um, it, we tried to be as encompassing as we could there. Um, and I think it, you know, that comes from just building all these projects over the years. We had just had so many requests of different, different needs from different clients. And so we just made sure that the, that the studio could handle everything that we needed. And also for our own purposes, because we, since Builder is built on, on top of all this, we use all these settings, right. For our own. Um, and actually this last release, uh, we changed it to immediate sign up from requiring a verification email. Um, and this is something that, you know, just for everyone's information, like you get a lot of drop off whenever you require verification emails. And so, you know, if you remove that verification requirement and just go straight default to a password, let them do a magic link if they prefer it, but default to password and go straight in. We actually ended up after we made that change, it was like a hundred percent conversion from there to the next step. You know, we were losing no one at that point. Whereas before we would lose different percentages every week because, you know, you have to go to your email and check it and you get distracted and you do something else and, you know, you just never get back to it or you get back to it a week later or something. Um, so yeah, I would advise on in that front, just from experience of doing this, maybe allow for immediate sign up, but also give that option for the uh, magic link if people don't want to use passwords. Cause there are some people who just really don't want to use passwords. But thank you, Doreen, that was great. And uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to chat them or just uh, unmute and ask as well anytime. Um, but given the time, I'm gonna go ahead and just dive right in to talking about pages and data. Uh, let's see, and I apologize if y'all can hear, it sounds like somebody's like banging on something. That's because someone is in my backyard fixing a fence and it's like right there, so. Unfortunate timing, uh, but I'll dive in real quick and then I'll pass the mic over to Drew anyways. So I'm in this project, this is this is my uh, cycles project. It's like a task management and project management uh, project that I built for our internal use. Um, so I wanna talk about two things. One is page authentication. So this is the app page here and this app page, if I, I'll zoom in on it a little bit, um, maybe zoom out a little bit. Uh, so this is like the app page of the project. So this one, I needed it to be authenticated only. Like you can't get to this page if you're not signed in. And you'll see if the setting is set, you'll see it up here. This little key icon will be there saying that it requires authentication. And also this icon here is for data listeners. So if you set up a data listener on that page to run any flow on the page, you're going to see this icon here. So that's what those two icons mean. Now to set this setting, if you click on that, it's going to open up the page properties over here on the right. You can also get to those page properties by clicking on this, the page body, um, and that will open it up. You can also get to them by clicking on this and going to page properties. Those all go to the same page properties setting. And there's this one toggle down here just saying this page requires auth. If you turn that on, then this page will require authentication. So that's one way to do the setup to where when they get to this page, if somebody goes to the route of that page, um, it won't allow off. 
but it's there's also another setting for this in the routes. So we'll go look at that in just a moment. This is important though, because you can actually set, you know, not all pages that require auth are gonna have a route going to them. Maybe it's like an internal page that can or cannot be retrieved based on authentication, but it's not the full outer page of the app. And so that's what this is for. You can go individually per page and allow certain pages to have authentication and not. Uh, the other method is in the routing. So if you look here, I have this slash app route and I have an unauthenticated page of website home. The authenticated page is app. So basically whenever a user goes to slash app, so if you went to cycles.so slash app right now, it's gonna redirect you to the home page because you're not signed in. If you're signed in and you go to the same page, it's gonna take you to the app. So this is really nice. It's a, it's a backend redirect, it's on the server. So it's not like do, pulling up a page in JavaScript and then redirecting them. Um, so it just basically returns the proper page no matter what. Um, so that's the second way of handling that. And those two methods combined, I'll use both for my, my root page, like the app page. And then I'll also go in and set any of the internal pages that are only used within there to require authentication as well. So that way everything in there, like no one can get access to those pages unless they've signed up and have a proper uh, login token. So that's URL route and, uh, and page authentication. Uh, feel free to chat any questions if you'll have any. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about was data authentication. Um, this gets a little more complex depending on what you're wanting to do with it. Um, you may or may not have a need for this depending on the app you're doing. But if you're doing something that's like a two-sided marketplace, for instance, you might want something like this. Maybe you want the user who creates the record to be the only one who can modify the record. And you want to make that, you don't want to do that type of security in JavaScript. You want to make sure that's done on the server side so that there's no um, you know, risk that someone could like hack it and just send a request uh, and get that, that request saved. So the way you set that up is in the data collections area, so over here on the left. If I open that up, I'm gonna go into the settings. I know this one, my organizations in my project is like it's the top level record. So everything else in cycles is underneath that record logically. So like I'm, when I'm thinking about it, I've got an organization, Inside of an organization, I have a cycle. Instead of that, I have a set of tasks and I have other records related to that cycle. So that organization is the top level piece. So I set all my permission settings here. By default, when you create a new collection, these three settings will be on. It'll actually be the inverse of this. So you'll have allow non-auth non records get, create and permanently delete will all be on. So that means that anyone who tries to, whether they're signed in or not, will be able to get the records, create and modify records, and permanently delete the records. So you typically, if you're building an internal app or something like that, you're going to want to set these settings to not allow these certain things. Like in this app, I didn't want there to ever be a possibility of someone accidentally permanently deleting an organization. Right. So what I did instead was I allow them to mark it deleted. And then I have a archived and non-archived setting or a set of views to show them, here's your archived organizations, here's your active organizations. So these settings are just really important if you're wanting to maintain data security, it's all server side based. Now the more complex setup that's in here is user restrictions. So user restrictions can get pretty deep here um, and it's, open-ended user restrictions. So it's not a user role-based setup. You create your own user role-based setup inside of your project. Um, and we did it that way because it's just way more flexible. This allows you to have many-to-many -many relationships, one-to-many -one relationships, and create a structure of applying these uh, restrictions down the stack. So for instance, in my setup, I have an access type for organizations of user invitation only. What that means is that the only people who will be able to access a certain organization are the creator of the record and anyone that the creator has actually invited. So they have to invite using an action, there's a, a user uh, invitation action 
inside of builder in the in the actions list. And when they when you run that action, you specify a login ID, so like their email address, and what permission settings that user is going to get inside of that collection. So in my case, for cycles, we you create an organization and you add users to your team. And when you're adding users to your team, I'm creating the user record, but I'm also setting them up as invited to that organization. And that gives them access to that. So other authenticated users can sign into cycles, but they cannot get access to the organization unless they've been invited. Right? So this allows me to set up sort of like a Slack type uh, authentication mechanism, right? Where they, you're signed in, you're a part of multiple organizations, and you can only get access to the content within the organizations you're part of. And then similar to that, we have child, or as a part of that, we have child collections where any collection that is a child of this organization's collection gets the same restrictions applied to it. So what that means is that if a user or if someone, anyone in the world goes and tries to do a request for the tasks of anything, in my cycles project, that they can only get access to the tasks where they are a member of the organization, where they've been invited as a user of, the, of that organization, and they have to be authenticated with an active token, right? So all this is handled server side. So there's no way to really hack this. You can't, I mean, obviously everything at some level is hackable, but the only way to get in there, you'd have to be on our servers to do it. You couldn't do it from JavaScript. Um, so I know that that can get really deep and really complicated. Um, I'm happy to dive into some of the actions probably on another call, but if y'all are interested in seeing more detail on like how I set up that structure or how the, how the actions flow or the user forms and things like that, I'm happy to dive into that at, uh, like I could do a video on it or something and send it out to the community too. But that's it. Um, I didn't see if there were any questions because I couldn't uh, see. Nope. Cool. All right, I don't want to run out of time. So we're going to dive straight over to Drew. Drew, you want to show your screen? Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm just going to quickly show uh, sign in with Twitter and sign in with Google buttons, which are new. The sign in with Twitter actually isn't even in the studio yet. <clears throat> if you want it today, I can send the pattern or any of us can, but um, we're gonna put it into the actual studio as soon as I make a lesson for it because both the Twitter and the Google, you have to set up an app. Like in, for Twitter, you have to sign into Twitter, set up your app and that gives you keys and that's how it works on your site. And same with Google, you have to set up an app for like each instance. So there's some instructions basically. So we don't wanna put them in the studio until those lessons are in place, but the Google, sign in with Google is in the studio and there is a lesson for it already. Um, <clears throat> but I'll just show them quickly, like a little bit how they work and then just show them working. Um, really when you use them, the whole awesomeness of it, you don't even have to care how they work. You just drop them in. And what happens on the back end is it actually creates a real user in your project. So when you sign in with Twitter, you know, the, the user doesn't have to create an account or, or do anything in your project, but they do become a user in your project. So all of the built-in user actions work like sign out, checking if they're signed in or not, all that stuff. And then in that way, in this case, um, this is a real app that I have called Tweet Draft. And if they sign in with Builder stuff or Twitter stuff, it doesn't matter. All my actions, the rest of the app still work and, and do everything the same. So what I did for, uh, let's see, for the Twitter one, I pulled in this pattern. Sorry, there we go. So let me see. Um, and I'll just show you, this is the level of instructions we're talking about. This is what will be in the lessons where you drop the button, you add an action that comes with a pattern. This is about setting up the, the app on Twitter. It's really easy, but it's just a couple steps. And then in Twitter's case, once you click that button, you have to, it, there's a callback URL, it sends them to a page in your app. So you just create a page and add an action on page load. And that action on page load is what is gonna either redirect them back into your app if it was successfully logged in or handle an error. So that's pretty much all it is. But what it looks like in practice is I, I did this actually like half an hour before this builder hour. I came into the sign up page and I just dropped this Twitter button here and it's got this sign in with Twitter action on it. 
which just has a bunch of keys. There's like four secrets that I put in here, which I got when I created my Twitter app. So, and I think I might even have that open. So this, yeah, so this is my Twitter app here. So I just created an app like called Tweet Draft and it gives me this stuff. And then I don't know where exactly, but somewhere on here, it gives me those keys and it's just a copy paste. So you copy paste them into here. And then I set a specific callback URL, which I made in this case, I did this in the most simple way possible. I have a completely blank page here that has, and, and the, the URL route is slash off. So my callback is slash off. I fill that out here and I have to fill it out in my app details in Twitter. That's a requirement from Twitter. But once I do that, um, when someone clicks this button, it's gonna automatically take them to Twitter to sign in. If they're already signed into Twitter, it's just gonna authenticate them instantly. And then it's gonna redirect them to this off page. And the off page on page load, there's another action that comes with the pattern. So this would just be in builder once we put it in. And all this does, you have to put those same keys back in and you tell it you know, where you're getting that token from, similar to the emails actually. Twitter sends, if it's a, you know, if you have slash off, which is my callback URL, it'll send it to slash off question mark OAuth token equals some crazy string. So this is just, you're specifying to get that string, but, um, and actually there's a few things you get. And then if it's successful, it can do one action. And if it fails, it can do another. And um, in this case, actually in my app, the header handles whether you're signed in or signed out. So I actually just redirected to home in both cases. So if Twitter is successful, it's gonna put you right into your list of tweet drafts. And if Twitter sign in is unsuccessful, it's just gonna pop that sign up, uh, sign in, sign up, back, uh, back up, which that's just because how my app is set up. That's how I do it anyway. You could also send it to a specific page or show a specific error or do something different on error if you wanted. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty much all it is. So in practice, when I load tweetdraft.com, comes to the sign up page first, I can sign in with Twitter here. And I think I'm probably already going to be signed into Twitter. So it just redirects me back and then I'm signed in. And this user, I don't have any tweets here. It's, I, I just did this, like I said, so it's blank. But that did create a real user in here that I can see this Twitter user here. And it's completely confidential. I actually didn't allow, in my app settings, I didn't allow it to send the email address. So in this case, if people sign in with Twitter to my app, I won't even know their email. But you can, that's a setting in Twitter. You can actually take their email if you need it and, and do stuff with it. But yeah, that's Twitter. And so like I said, if in the future, you know, you'll just go to elements and drop in that sign in with Twitter button, set some of these settings. And then uh, very similarly, sorry, I got stuff in my way. For, uh, for Google sign-in, I, I created a blank um, project here because I can show this one. It's already in the studio. There's uh, two, two buttons now for Google, sign-in light and sign-in dark. They're just visual. They're the same exact button, just the different visual themes, and they match Google's guidelines exactly. So if you drop one of these buttons on, it's going to not only create the button, but what we did was we, we coded the button we like, like they'll give you a button image. We actually redid it in code so that it's fully scalable and looks nice, but it also gives you an advantage of, you can edit this text. So if you have a different language site, or if you wanted to write something different here, you can edit it. But ultimately you're just getting this little block, uh, which is the Google button. And it comes also with an action, uh, Google auth in it. And so in here you do need to set, um, a value from, so like same thing as Twitter I had created, and this is in a lesson. So actually let me point that out before I go too far in. When you drop this in, I've already done it. So it didn't come up, but a lessons banner will come up. that says Google off lesson. And that actually tells you like, this is how you set up your app in Google. You know, these are the next steps, whatever. So, so that'll tell you, it's pretty straightforward. You're just clicking stuff and getting an API key essentially, but it's a couple steps. So in here, this client ID is what you need to grab. So I just paste that here. And the, the button itself comes built in. It'll give you a success and an error action and they come with it over here. And in this case, the default, it's just console logging something. But what you would do is here, you know, you might say like open a page, you do whatever you want. You can redirect them on a success or you can redirect them or pop up an error message or an error. But that's all you do, you drop that on and then if I preview this, there's this button that when you click it, it will just pop up to your 
you know, and I can sign in here. Um, and that's that. And so like this case, nothing happened. It'll probably say success in the console here if I inspect. So yeah, success. So I know I successfully just signed in with Google and now I'm signed in. If this were a real app, you know, like I said, all those sign in actions and sign out actions, everything is consistent with as if I signed in with a builder native user. I think Drew, did that pop something up? Because I think maybe the, did it end up oh, you up? Did, I'm sorry. I think it didn't show it. Yeah. 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 The, yeah, the so way Google works, it pops up a yeah. little window. Yeah. So if you've ever signed in with Google, you probably know what I'm talking about. It, it pops up, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sharing my full screen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's awesome. The, the thing that, that I really like about the way we built all these auth with third-party auth is what Drew said. It automatically works with all of our other authentication setup methodology. So it's going to work with all the data setup that I just showed. It's going to work with all the actions for signing out for, you know, checking if they're authenticated, all that stuff is treated exactly the same. Um, and actually the, the builder authentication backend is actually created in such a way that you can also do sign in with builder. We just haven't exposed those things yet either. So it is a full auth backend uh, that we built from scratch there. So um, like we said earlier, if there are any other types of auth that we want to, that you, that you want to see or anything that you're, if, especially if you're using something in a project right now, if you've got something you want to put to production and you need like uh, John, if you need GitHub and for a project you're doing right now, let's just go, we can go put that one in next. Like that's kind of how we're approaching it. We're getting a lot of requests for Xano because people are wanting to use Xano backends. Um, so we'll probably go after that one first. But these really aren't that hard to set up anymore. Um, it's you can look at how the JavaScript works in those actions. You can actually just dive in and see them. Um, so yeah, so I think that is pretty much it. Let's see if we have any questions. I think Fraser had one, um, and the users that shows which login method for the. There is not uh, anything specific that says which login method, but the. Um, I think the string that comes back that's stored as the login ID will show it. So there's no like, there's no column in there that says login type builder, Google or something like that. But in the name of the user, the actual login ID, like Drew, I don't remember what it said when you showed it for the- for Like the Twitter. Twitter dot and then yeah. an ID and then Google yeah. dot an ID. And, and when you set up, when you create a custom authentication, you actually can set up basically what you want it to say, like that word, and then it'll use, you know, the ID that they give you or the token or whatever they give you because everything's different, but it's versatile. It's defined in the JavaScript that sends out. So uh, the way that it works for the coders in the room, there's a our, our internal API, the BAPI is what it's called, the BAPI. Um, inside of there, there's a method that you can call for doing the authentication. You're going to pass it certain information like that, that will then on our back end perform the authentication, create the user return a token to the page. So now it's stored with the cookie and it's there uh, authenticated and the user record gets saved at that same time. Um, so the next time they sign in, that same mechanism checks to see on the back end, are they already a user? Do I need to create one or am I just re-authenticating them? Um, so eventually I think we're gonna end up needing to do things like, you know, this is the same login ID. So you can sign in with Google one time and then with Twitter the second time and it's the same user record, right? So that's one thing that's not in there yet um, where there's no way for it to tie those things together just yet. But we'll eventually, um, we already see it coming. Like we were already talking about it. This is going to be a request pretty quick here. Um, so we'll eventually get that in there as well. Is there anything else on that, Dorian, that, that uh, we should highlight in that boppy call? I know Dorian worked with our developers on, on setting all that up. No, not at the moment. We'll definitely need to expose you know, all that in some form of documentation, because there's yeah. a lot to the auth externals. Um, yeah. But yeah, we'll, we'll work on that, put something together, and you know, get it out to everybody so you know, you know this is the format to follow. And if you ever do want to just go look, you can go look at the Boppy model. Yeah. Uh, it's a JavaScript file in there and you can see all the different parts of that. If you just, uh, it's in sources in, I don't remember what the main, what are, what's the main folder called in there, Dorian? Sources. Do sources. I mean, and what's the next one? There isn't any, it's just. Uh, it's just right in the, in the sources. So look in there at boppy.model. 
Um, and you can see the JavaScript, all the methods you can call and see exactly, it's not just that too. It's like all of our path functions, all that stuff is inside of there. So prior to us having the documentation out, the formal documentation on it, it's pretty straightforward the way it's written. I don't know how to write that code, but I can go read it and see what it's doing. Um, so it's not very, you know, it's not like obtuse in there. Um, let's see. John, what, what did you mean by that? Uh, adding the add Twitter, Facebook account. When you were saying about if somebody signs in with Google Auth and then they want to sign in again with Twitter Auth, rather than letting them sign in and create a second account, maybe just put it in their, their user settings to connect Twitter, connect Facebook, connect, yeah. et cetera. There you go. I like so that. a lot of a lot of the pages use that I've seen. I like that. Cool. Well, we appreciate you all showing up for this one. This is a more technical one, a little deeper in inside of it. There's and there's a lot involved in our authentication mechanisms there. Um, but feel free to reach out if you have any questions, or like I said, if you've got any specific ones that you're working on in a project, or your clients need, or you need for for something you're building. Let us know what that is, and um, if, even if we can't get to it right away, we can help you. If you if you want to if you want to go give it a shot at setting up the JavaScript to do it, it's really not that bad. It's really not that complicated because the Boppy handles most of that work. Um, so yeah, just let us know. And I guess thanks everybody for coming. We're kind of at the at the time here, so have a great weekend. All right. See you guys. Thanks everyone. Everyone. See you soon. That was great.